joy it is to worship the Lord in song and in prayer and in giving. And we're going to continue worshiping in the Lord by sitting under the Word of God. And we have a real privilege this morning to hear from Andy Simpson. See you there, brother. Andy's a graduate of the Master's Seminary in 2008. Um, he's here with his wife, Catherine, and four children, uh, Emily, Sophia, Mark, and Alyssa. hope I got that right. And um, we just have a, a great privilege to hear from Andy today. So Andy, why don't you come and open the Word of God? Thank you, brother. Thanks, brother. Yeah. Indeed, how great is our God and what a joy it has been to sing with you this morning and, and praise him such a blessing and a privilege just to be here worshiping with you today and before i begin today i i just like to say what a blessing you all have been as a church and catherine and my life and our kids in more recent times going right back to nelson street days and hastings bible church church at riverbend and here we are today and also the many impact Bible conferences that we've just had such a spiritual feast at. You know, it's just been such a blessing. And I want to encourage you this morning that despite all these changes and, and where we are today, that God is not finished yet. I want to encourage you with a, a little verse from Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. For I am confident of this very thing that... He who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. You know, we've just been so blessed by warm hospitality, great preaching and godly counsel. And I encourage you this morning to just keep standing as a pillar of the truth. Keep reaching out and encouraging people and extending the love of God to them. We're going to be delving into Proverbs chapter 4 this morning. So... Please turn there, and while you're doing that, I just want to, for you to think of a little example for the moment, the planet Jupiter. If, like my wife and I, you've seen the stars in the last few nights, um, just near the waxing moon, you will have seen that bright light shining, Jupiter. And if you had a powerful telescope and you could zoom up, and look right at that planet, you'd see all those marvellous marble colours around the planet. But it's all not what it seems. Those are actually very turbulent bands of wind that are going around on the surface cloud level. And probably the most famous one is the Great Red Spot. That's two times larger than Earth, and that storm has been raging for over 150 years. You know, and scientists, they kind of wondered... What's causing all this turbulence on the surface of Jupiter? Well, in 1995, NASA's Galileo probe descended through the clouds into the atmosphere, and they found that at a minus 170 degrees really freezing temperature above the clouds to a sizzling 300 degrees below, that it was quite a change in that temperature. And as it descended further, they calculated that the core of Jupiter must be somewhere in the vicinity of 35,000 degrees Celsius. Most importantly, this super hot core and the speed at which it is rotating is the cause of all that is happening on the surface of that planet. The core of Jupiter is the engine that drives that planet. It's the basis for all that happens on the surface. And it's a bit like that with people. It's a bit like that with us. Our heart is the engine. Our core is our heart. And it drives all our external words and behaviors. And if our hearts are functioning as God wants them to be, then it's fair to say that all our external words and behaviors will be godly. So today we're going to look at four essential components for living a godly life from the heart. The first essential component for living a godly life from the heart is to keep listening to God's word. But to do that, we first need to read this word. So if you pop down in Proverbs 4 to verse 20, 
Let's read through to the end. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your sight. Keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to all their body. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put devious speech far from you. Let your eyes look directly ahead and let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you. Watch the feet of the path of your feet and all your ways will be established. Do not turn to the right nor to the left. Turn your foot from evil. I've titled today's message, The Heart of the Matter. And that first essential component for living a godly life from the heart is keep listening to God's word in verse 20. King Solomon was the man who had the privilege to write down these words. And he lived back as the third king of Israel in about 970 to 930 BC. And most um, scholars think that he probably composed these words in the early part of his life before he encountered many of the problems that he did with hundreds of wives and concubines and permitting their idols and taxing the people heavily. But early on, he was very concerned for his sons. And, and so through from chapter 1 to here, he's been giving quite a few addresses to his sons, this being the seventh one. And it's probably his son Rehoboam that he was talking to here. And so when he says that they're my words, they're not just his words at that point in time because the Holy Spirit of God was moving through Solomon, getting and using him to write down what he wanted to say. And so these words of God have been preserved right down in time to us today. These are universal principles that still apply to us. God is concerned that we might turn away from pursuing folly and to chase after wisdom. That is the main flow and thrust to this point. And so God says, give attention to my words. It's an imperative. We must wake up and listen up to God's words. Pay attention to the whole Bible. You know, if you're anything like me, it's not easy to be distracted sometimes. You know, we live in this information age, don't we, where there's just so much media and apps and gadgets all vying and begging for our attention. <laughs> Maybe this morning your smartphones buzz quietly in your pocket a few times trying to get your attention. But can we blame, blame the lack of Bible reading on the media around us? Can we blame it on our hectic or busy schedules and various trials and problems? Or maybe it's because we just don't like really sitting still and having to think about what God is saying. Maybe it's because we realize we might actually have to change. Listen to what Howard Hendricks has to say about Bible study. He says, May I suggest that you might be settling for a decaffeinated form of Christianity, one that promises not to keep you awake at night. You see, God gives us his word not to make us comfortable, but to conform us to the character of Christ. And that goes way beyond pious feelings and good intentions. It penetrates to the level of our schedules and checkbooks and friendships and jobs and families. On well, the second half of verse 20, it says, Incline your ear to my sayings. And what's going on here is that Solomon's using Hebrew parallelisms. It's a common feature of wisdom literature. And the whole point of it is to add emphasis, but each time add a slightly new little flavor. It's literally turn the ears, zoom them in, focus. You've probably seen a cat's ears, over 30 muscles. 
and they can just rotate those things 180 degrees. You know, all true Christians will deliberately turn their ears to hear what God is saying. And as we practice that again and again and again, it should soon become an automatic thing that we just love to hear what God is saying to us from his word. It requires deliberate action and repeated so that it becomes habitual. But it's almost as if Solomon was anticipating that his sons would, you know, just hear the word and, and then not do anything about it. And so he uh, focuses on another feature, and that brings us to the second component of living a godly life from the heart, and that's to keep meditating on God's word. In verses 21 to 22, he says, Do not let them depart from your sight. Solomon is personifying wisdom as a person, as if they're able to walk right out of sight. Imagine for a moment that you go on a trip overseas and you go to some foreign country and you're out in the wilderness and you've booked this tour and you're following this tour guide. Would it be smart to lose energy or get lazy or fall behind the tour guide? What if you saw a mirage over there in the wilderness and you took off to see that? You'd be left very disappointed. And then where would you go from that point? You know, we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. We need to be following him. We need to not get lazy or fail to keep walking in his very footsteps. No. We can't think that this life is too hard and just give up or get comfortable. No, we need to keep listening. We need to not let God's words depart from our sight. We must not neglect them or become forgetful. Keep them in the middle of your heart. It then has another parallel there. Another imperative. Another command. The best way for us to not let God's words depart from our memories is to actually meditate them on and deliberately recall them to memory. For most of us, information doesn't just simply stay in there automatically. Not many of us have photographic memories, and so there is work to do. We need to ensure that God's word comes right down into us to a heart level where it's going to permeate and penetrate and affect us. Repetition and habits produce excellent memories and then the Holy Spirit can bring those precious truths of Scripture to our minds at the right time. Psalm 119 verse 11 says, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. And think about Joshua before he was about to enter into the promised land. God said to him in 1 verse 8, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. But what is this hiding in the heart? What is this meditating day and night? J.I. Packer, in his book, Knowing God, has this to say. Meditation is the activity of calling to mind, thinking over, dwelling on, and applying oneself to the various things one knows about God, his ways, his works, purposes, and promises. Meditation is something of not emptying the mind of information, but of bringing it back to our minds and thinking over it deliberately. How does that apply to my life? What areas does God's word address? It's at the heart level that this needs to occur. I just want to pause in the flow of things here this morning for a moment and just think about the heart. What is it? What does the heart refer to? It's not the worldly concept of emotional love. And in the scriptures, it's not often referring to the physical heart that beats in the chest. No, it's rather talking about our inner personhood, the core of who we are. 
Just as Jupiter's core drives the whole planet's surface, so our heart is the engine in all that we do. J. Adams had this to say about the heart. It is safe to say that the Bible uses the word heart to speak of the inner man, or as Peter puts it in a thoroughly definitive way, the hidden person of the heart. Plainly then, heart in the Bible is the inner life that one lives before God and himself. A life that is unknown by others because it is hidden from them. So how does the Bible explain the various aspects of the heart? What are the different functions of the heart? Well, obviously it involves thinking. Heart and mind are often used interchangeably in the scriptures. It involves our attitudes and our motives for what we do. And we act based on our will. All this is involved in the heart. And our heart is also influenced by our conscience. But our conscience needs to be shaped by the truth of Scripture. And we also experience feelings and emotions in the inner person and our heart level. But more importantly, the heart is driven by desires and affections. What we worship. Therefore, it's logical that whatever we worship in our hearts is going to dictate how our life is lived. But if we worship idols in our hearts, then what happens is that we dethrone God. He loses his authority for our behavior. And the result of that is that sin pours out. Have a listen to what Ezekiel says in chapter 14, verses 2 to 3. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their hearts and have put right before their faces the stumbling block of their iniquity. The problem with idol worship is that it blinds us to how we are. It blinds us to what our behaviors then are. And you might say, well, we don't worship stone idols and metal idols and different things. I've seen that in overseas countries, but we don't do that here. So what are idols of the heart for us? Well, they could be in some main categories like pleasure. We just want to be satisfied, and so we set up things in our hearts that control our behavior. It could be to do with power. We just want to be in control all the time. It could be to do with position, where we just want to have the praise of men. We want to be um, mollycoddled. We want to have our pride and our ego boosted. These are all terrible idols that will rule the heart. What we must have is God at the center of our hearts. We must worship God alone and pursue Him. And only then can we live for His praise and glory. Psalm 42 verse 1 to 2 says, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Not dead idols, for the living God. But to pursue God and to value Him and to worship Him, It requires knowledge. Therefore, it is absolutely crucial that we realize this morning, if we don't already, or if we just need a reminder, that it is absolutely crucial to keep meditating on the words of Scripture, to keep pursuing God. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Or in the New Testament, in Colossians 3.16, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom. Well, let's come back to the flow of our text now. And, um, you know, there's some questions to ask here. Why should we keep meditating on Scripture? Well, verse 22 says, at the end of it, um, for from it flow the springs... Oh, sorry. Um, For they are life to those who find them, in verse 22 at the beginning there. This is the reason. 
The benefit is that it brings life. It brings spiritual life and most importantly, eternal life. Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Many people are are searching for solutions to their problems. They want to be free of sin and idolatry. Maybe this morning you are desperately seeking that. Maybe you are seeking life itself and you're not a believer. You don't understand quite who God is. You just can't quite find it. Well, the good news this morning is that God can save your soul. God can give you life. He can change you at a heart level. In fact, give you a new heart. Ezekiel 36 verse 25 to 27 says this, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your body and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. That is what God can do. But you say, well, how does that take place? How can I be saved? How can I receive a new heart today? You must believe that God has provided a solution. And that solution is Jesus Christ. God sent his own son to die on the cross to pay for your sins with his death. If you believe that Jesus has died to pay for all your sins and to change you, if you are willing to repent of all your sin, confess it and turn to God, ask forgiveness, he will do that. He will not deny you forgiveness if you are genuine. James 4 verse 7 to 8 says, Submit therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Yes, Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the one who can save. Jesus died and rose from the grave that you might have life. Believe that. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and, most importantly, Lord of your heart. And if you then believe, this is the promise of 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. Salvation brings a removal of the old heart and the installation of a new heart. And so, if you seek them, you will find that they are indeed life. God's words are life. They're life for finders keepers. But they're also, in the second part of verse 22, health to their entire body. And this is a general principle that... God's words will be health to the entire body. It doesn't mean that we won't experience health trials in our life. Because the fact is, we all live in a fallen world. We all live with viruses. Well, not all of us, but we all have the potential to be affected by viruses or, or hereditary um, diseases or even life-threatening injuries. But why does God sometimes allow health trials in our life? There's a few reasons for that. Maybe I won't have all of them here this morning, but one of them could be is that if you're not a Christian here today, he might allow a health trial in your life to humble you, to make you see that you need salvation. It could also be to build character in Christians' lives. It may be that God is using a disability or a health issue in your life simply to glorify him. And that can be of wonderful instruction and encouragement to other Christians who are watching. It could also be that God uses a health trial in your life to discipline you if there is unrepentant sin in your life. 
Yes, we live in a fallen world and if we allow sin and idolatry to control us, it will also have a negative impact on our bodies. Just think of some of the things like anxiety can cause breathing problems, bowel problems, guilt can lead to loss of sleep and knotted muscles and aching bones. What about anger, lack of self-control, for example, drunkenness? These things can even lead to physical injuries. So how we think, what goes on in our heart, has a direct impact on our bodies. But correct thinking, godly motives, and a guilt-free conscience will generally lead to healthy bodies in old age. And this is the promise in the previous chapter in Proverbs 3, verse 1 to 2. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Today, our Heavenly Father is calling us to pay attention, to keep meditating on his words, because they're going to impact us. They should impact us. They should have an impact on our spiritual condition and they will also affect our health. They are life to those who find them and health to the entire body. Well, let's move on now to another component, an essential component for living a godly life from the heart. And that is keep Guarding your heart in verse 23. This is one of the most fundamental verses for Christians. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. The Hebrew language is literally more than all guarding, keep guarding your heart. This concept of guarding our heart is really serious. It's really important. It must be done with all vigilance, diligence. It's essential because that is where we filter out how we might interact in this world. We must guard our hearts with the weapon of God's word. It's not something that is passive that I can just sit back and everything will be all right. No. It must be active. Think of Nehemiah, for example, Nehemiah chapter 4, and you have the people of Israel coming back from captivity, and they involved in rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And in verse 17, it says that they worked with a tool in one hand and with a sword in the other. So there must be that dual focus, the dual focus of building God's truth into our lives, but also standing with the word of God in the other hand, our focus on the word that we might defend against all enemies. The flesh, the world and the devil, they are not going to stop. We must guard against both the external and the internal. Guarding our heart means diagnosing its internal moral condition on a regular basis. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and it is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. We must use God's word for that internal examination. It must pierce deeply. It must go to a heart level. But also, guarding our heart means that we must arm ourselves and stay alert at all times. External attacks will come. We can't have no attitude of she'll be right. I'm saved. No worries. Nothing can touch me now. I'm secure because of what Christ has done. No. Ephesians 6 warns about this. Verse 13, Therefore take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything 
to stand firm. And so all that armour must be on and we must be standing firm, waiting and ready for when the attacks come, and they will. Sin is still living in our bodies, is it not? The world is still trying to press us into its mould. Satan is still prowling around, stalking, seeking to devour. We all have the internal and external fights. Listen, our heart is just so important to guard with God's truth. We must guard it more than anything else because from it flow all our behaviours. The heart of the matter is the matter of our hearts. And there's no shortcut to a godly life, no. It requires discipline and regular, frequent periods of studying God's word and praying. A godly heart further requires a brutal a brutal and honest weighing up of our thoughts and actions against the truths of God. It requires a violent tearing out of any idols that might have got our, their hooks into us. And even then we're still not done. No, God must be enthroned on our hearts again. He must be our all in all. And even more than that, we then must discipline ourselves to replace Thoughts and behaviours that are no good with what is good. This is the only real replacement theology. Well, there's a final essential component for living a godly life from the heart. And that is, number four, keep sanctifying your behaviour. Verses 24 to 27. Now, it's not my intention to go deep into all of these verses today you can meditate on those yourself and and see how your life measures up to those but maybe just a few thoughts these four verses are again all these hebrew parallelisms and but there's three main areas that god is concerned about three main areas of our behavior that god wants us to keep sanctifying and he's with us in that these areas are our talk our gawk and our walk Our talk, we must put away from you, it says, a deceitful mouth and put devious speech far from you. This is, although these are, he's using these um, body parts, the, he's using them as idioms about how we morally conduct ourselves. So with our, all our communications is wrapped up in the talk, all of it, from our facial expressions to our tone of voice, the words that we say, the different ways that we communicate. These are all imperatives here. These are all commands of God. They're not options that we can pick and choose how we want to behave. All of them. Crooked words, lies, deceit. Is there any of that in your life? What about devious speech? This is trickery. Manipulation. Do you enjoy the power you have manipulating other people with your words? What about your social media activity? How does that stack up with this verse? God demands that we constantly clean up our talk, all our areas of communication. But it's not just our talk. Another major area is our gawk. Using this verse 25, let your eyes look directly ahead and let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you. God's pleading here. He's pleading that your focus be in the right place. To keep looking in a righteous direction. Examining God's straight ways. We need to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, do we not? He is our tour guide in this life. We need to keep following his godly example. On the negative side of things, we mustn't be gawking at temptation, at things that will satisfy the lusts of the flesh. 
We mustn't be giving in to the idols of selfish pleasure. No. But not only that, our eyes, our spiritual vision needs to be a discerning one. We need a discerning worldview to avoid the lies of Satan and all the ambushes of worldliness. Well, the third major area is our walk. Watch the path of your feet, and all your ways will be established. This imperative here, the word watch in the Hebrew, is um, based on, on scales, of balancing them, of leveling them out. So it could be balance the path of your feet or, or make them level, it may say in other versions. So on the scales, we have the word of God in one hand and we have our behaviours on the other. How is our walk of life stacking up to the scriptures? Is it righteous and balanced? Or are you being weighed down by sin? I like what the Net Bible, the New English Translation, has to say in Hebrews 12, verse 1 to 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, we must get rid of every weight and the sin that clings so closely and run with endurance the race set out for us, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Let me encourage you this morning. If you're practicing a balanced, righteous life, then praise God. He promises that all your ways will be established. He promises that that act of living righteously done again and again will establish you in those holy habits. And then it will be so much easier to avoid temptation. The last verse says also to do with our walk, do not turn to the right or the left. Turn your foot from evil. There's two aspects to these commands, obviously, and that is if you are walking a righteous life, the imperative here is not to turn off, to not be tempted, but to stay the course. Alternatively, maybe you have been tempted Maybe you haven't even fallen to sin yet, but you're getting close to the edge or you're even on the slippery slope. And if you're on the slippery slope and the storms come, you will slip and you will tumble headlong into trouble and despair. So please, the imperative here is turn away from every form of evil. All these three areas, our talk, our gawk, and our walk, must be submitted to Christ. There needs to be sanctification of all these areas in our lives. And it starts with God's truth, coming in and meditating on it, and then guarding our hearts. It is then that we can be empowered to change our behaviours. Romans 6 verse 11 to 14 says, Consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its lusts, and do not go on presenting the members of your body as, uh, to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are under, not under law, but under grace. Praise God. He has freed all true believers from the power of sin. He has given us the Holy Spirit, Christ in us, and God is concerned with helping us guard our hearts. But there's a danger here. The danger here this morning is that some people get so good at conforming their outward behaviors that they ignore their heart condition. And it's to their own detriment and ruin. And it brings insult to the name of Christ. Jesus had very harsh 
words on this matter. He said in Matthew 15, verse 8 to 9, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me. So don't be deceived. The heart of the matter is that while man looks at the outward appearance, God looks at your hearts this morning. And he looks at my heart. I'm there with you. We need open honesty with God. So don't be deceived. The reality is, is that if your heart is not in a right relationship with God, then all your behaviors are like filthy rags to him. No matter how good you might make yourself look in front of others, God is studying your heart, even as you sit here this morning. So humble your hearts before God today. Confess and repent of anything that is unrighteous in God's eyes. Whether it's obvious sins or hidden sins, seek forgiveness today. Come to God based on the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Draw near to God. So this morning the challenge is to cultivate these four essential components. It's so that we can live a godly life for His glory. You know, and the thrust of this passage is, is that it's not just a one-off time that you do this, but that it's a regular, ongoing effort. And when you do that, and you allow that ongoing discipline to happen, then God can shape you into the person he wants you to be. Dr. John Streeter, a pastor who's even preached at this church before, once had this to say. The goal is to keep meditating on God's word until change occurs. The Christian life is not about trying to escape the troubles of life. The goal is to produce righteous fruit even in the storms of life, learning to make correct choices during trials and temptations is key. Then do it again and again and again and again until a righteous habit of thinking is formed such that following after righteousness becomes the norm for your heart. So can I encourage you? Start today. Don't let anything that will um, water down or detract from your relationship with God get in the way. Don't let it. Don't lose focus. You need to keep refilling your heart, the heart of your mind, with the Scriptures. Worship God alone, not anything else. And vigilantly guard your heart so that all your behaviors might be godly and flow out for his praise and glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us your word, that you still speak to us today right from out of the pages of Scripture. We thank you that you challenge us and you prick our consciences and your voice speaks loudly in our ears. It tugs at our heartstrings and, oh God, we pray this morning that you will help us to be open and honest before you, that we would examine afresh where our hearts are at. If there are any idols that have got their hooks into us, oh God, Show them to us. Make us realize that you must be our all in all. May we pursue you afresh. May we humbly bow before you and confess any sins. Oh God, keep working on us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.